Thank you so much, and I'm so glad to be here. Very excited about this, and found someone I know already in the audience. So I'll be talking tonight about some work specifically focused at um, Thomas Jefferson's second home, Poplar Forest, and Terry worked there with me in the past. So it's exciting to be here with all of you and find someone I know and in a week that's been so disorienting with the hurricane. But um, St. Augustine is, if you are interested, doing very well, coming together, everyone's helping each other. Um, school is open again and everything's functioning, um, but it is still a little disorienting. Um, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about two of my interests. My, my master's degree is in medical anthropology, and I'm very interested in health and well-being issues. Um, but I'm an archaeologist, and so how do you make those things work together? Well, I do that by looking at healthcare practices in the past. Um, and I love doing this in the 18th and 19th century because this was a time frame when people really didn't understand what the causes of diseases were because germ theory was just coming into play. And so they come up with all kinds of cultural explanations to try and make sense of why people are sick and who gets sick and who doesn't get sick and why. So I became interested in looking at that sort of thing. So when I say health consumerism, I am talking about it in the way that it's used in the modern sense that how, if um, patients had involvement in their own healthcare decisions, but also in an economic sense, when I say consumerism, most of my work looks at how enslaved people had access to goods, how they earned money or traded services to get access to goods, what they bought with their money or their labor, um, and what they did with those things. Um, but in this time frame, I'm looking at the economic aspect of um, the degrees of access enslaved African Americans had to resources that they used to shape their health and well-being. Um, so health was, of course, like most aspects of slaves' lives, a sphere that slave owners attempted to control, and enslaved laborers, of course, had to submit to that control. But they did, in the face of that, continue to engage in their own health practices, even when they were faced with very severe consequences. So I'm going to give you some examples of that. Um, Oh, there you go. You know, you can read my mind, right? So if I look this way, you'll advance the slide. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, this study is looking at the lives of enslaved laborers at Poplar Forest Plantation from about 1833 to 1861 within the broader context of slave society in the American South. So if you, the location of within the state of Virginia is where you see that red asterisk. Oh, I have a pointer. I don't know how to use it. I'm technologically disadvanced. Huh? Uh, see? Do you see? Do you see what three degrees will do for you? My 10-year-old um, my could do this. I can't. But now I feel compelled to use it all the time. Um, so that red asterisk there in between Bedford and Campbell counties, the city of Lynchburg, that's where Poplar Forest is. Um, the colors that you see there um, are about, they represent the number of slaves per county in 1860. So you see the concentration has moved from the Tidewater area and into central Virginia here, um, with the exception of one location over here in what becomes West Virginia. And the reason why you have a number of enslaved people, this barrier are the Blue Ridge Mountains. And so that was a barrier that um, enslaved people didn't cross frequently. They did that here because they had the salt works in Charleston. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, okay. So this is Poplar Forest. Oh, I sound really intelligent on this thing. And can I take this home? Um, I need this for class. I have authority on a microphone. Um, this is um, Poplar Forest here. Um, and it, this was Thomas Jefferson had this home built in 1806 on land he inherited from his father-in-law. Um, but he, in 1823, he willed it to, he gave it to his grandson, and his grandson sold it in 1858. Francis Epps, who you may know here in Florida because he came south to Tallahassee. Um, so Francis Epps migrated here, and when he did, he sold this house to a man named William Cobbs. And William and Marion Cobbs had one daughter, who you see here, and that's Emma's 
got um, Emma Cobb's um, Hutter and her husband Edward Hutter. So I'm not spending too much time talking about the Jefferson period out at Poplar Forest, but a little bit later when Edward and Emma lived in the house with their parents-in-law, uh, William and Marion Cobbs. And Marion Cobbs, in fact, outlasted everyone else in that home, um, aside from her grandchildren. So this is a list of some of the enslaved people from 1844, so I have some great historical documents to go. One of the reasons why I can look at an issue like healthcare and what people were thinking about health and well-being is because this man was a naval officer before he came to Poplar Forest, and he kept some terse but good records um, that helped me understand that process. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. So before we um, move back into examples from Poplar Forest, I want to talk a little bit about the model I use to look at this um, and the difference between disease and illness. Um, so disease is biological and it affects people indiscriminately. It's very democratic. It's the biological component. But illness is the social construct. How do people experience disease? How do they experience that? And it's really sort of an intersection between disease, patient, and culture. That's how people experience illness. Um, so building on that, um, uh, I was really interested in the medical anthropolo anthropologists um, Nancy Shepard Hughes and Margaret Locke. Um, they developed this model called the three bodies model that looks at the individual body, the social body, and the body politic, and how those intersect to um, reflect illness. Um, so the individual body, that's just sort of how people their life experiences, how do they experience um, disease. And the social body encompasses the way the individual body becomes sort of a canvas that nature, society, and culture is represented on. And the body politic here um, represents regulation, surveillance, and control of bodies in reproduction and sexuality, work, leisure, and sickness. So this model that was developed for looking at health and well-being in modern Brazil, I think was really useful to think about enslaved people, particularly because of the political aspects that circumscribe their access to health um, resources. Um, OK, so this, I love this. Love 19th century medicine. Um, so, because I didn't have to go through any of the treatment. Um, if you do make it to St. Augustine, one of the few things that remains in the Leitner Museum, um, the only original thing to the Leitner that was at the Alcazar is an electroshock therapy um, that pay, people would come and ask for them to hook them up and shock them. Um, so that's what we're, that's what we're dealing with here. Um, so prior to the 19th century, um, the practice of medicine was as much an art as a science in Western world. Um, and it, by the antebellum period, just before the Civil War, European, African, African American, and Native American medical theory and practices kind of coalesced on Southern plantations as a result of centuries of interaction. Um, so trying to tease out what particular individuals thought about health practices is a little problematic, but we do know about general contemporary trends. Um, these prevailing cultural models influenced how people understood health and well-being and how they experienced it. Um, for whites, disease theory and treatment was based primarily on um, the Hippocratic um, humoral theory that asserted that disease resulted from an imbalance in four body humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And so external forces or internal forces would generate that imbalance. Um, so treatment involved restoring the balance through use of emetics, purgatives, and phlebotomy, anything that would help you get rid of an excess of any of those bloody fluids, um, which we, we won't describe in too much detail. Um, there were alternative and irregular treatments favored by some white Virginians. Uh, I won't go into many of those here, but certainly there were alternatives. Um, and those alternatives demonstrate that there was diversity among 19th century medical practices. Um, and despite the various approaches to health, many people understood the experience of sickness and healing through religion. And the secularization of sickness increased with the rise of biomedicine as a scientific enterprise later in the 19th century, but that was kind of an uneven and controversial process. Um, so we're getting this sort of rise of biomedicine in the 19th century. Um, and alongside the rise of biomedicine and scientific practice, a large percentage of white and black Americans continued to understand illness and shape health practices through the lens of faith. 
the degree to which religion and science influenced their perspectives about health and well-being practices was not always shared between the groups. Um, the responses of slaveholders to enslaved people who relied on spiritual power for healing in various forms was very significantly shaped by shifting alignments of religious experience, scientific knowledge, and perceptions of who embodied medical authority. Okay, so in contrast, to whites, many enslaved African Americans had a broader relational view of health and well being. So, that relational conception linked the health of an individual to community relations, which honored kin relations by connecting the living with their ancestors and situated the authority of healers in the wisdom of elders and divine guidance. So, that perceived imbalance was not between, that resulted in illness, was not between physical humors, but among relationships between people, spirits, and ancestors. And that perspective was based on the a perspective of the universe in um, sacred terms. Okay. Um, so individual body, the lived experience. Um, and these are just from some of the 19th century medical records. And, well, I put that one there because I think it ties into the present. This is some of the issues that we're seeing. Um, but yes, um, the, you see some really interesting, um, again, these cultural conceptions of what is the cause. And so we'll talk about that. Um, but the presence of African American healers in 19th century Virginia, as I said, was a result of generations of adapting African medical practices to incorporate European and Native American influences, as well as adaptation to new physical, social, and political environments. What we know about 19th century healers comes from interviews with former slaves, oral traditions, court records, and other documents predominantly written by whites. African American healers served many roles on plantations, including midwives, conjurers, and root doctors. And their significance and value is evident from their persistence among enslaved populations in the Americas for centuries um, and into the present. The medical practices of African American healers intersected with spiritual beliefs and supernatural traditions, and patients sought their aid to deliver their children, prevent and cure natural diseases and supernatural illnesses for protection, and to influence the outcome of particular events or processes. So an example of that from Poplar Forest, and this is going back to the Jefferson period, some enslaved individuals at Poplar Forest sought out an African-American healer for one or more of these reasons in 1818. And that was toward the end of Jefferson's ownership of the property, and it was a really devastating year for the enslaved community at the property. Uh, five enslaved children and two men died. One child was stillborn, and several other people were violently ill. So by April 1819, Jefferson's overseer informed him, as you see here, those Negroes are still sickly. Hal has been confined almost three months. He says he is poisoned, and none but a Negro doctor can save him. I can't consent to employ these people unless instructed. So there's no evidence that Jefferson consented to that, but he may have, because there's another letter that comes in July from, from the uh, overseer, Joel Yancey, to um, Jefferson. And he says that members of the enslaved community charged Hercules with poisoning and the cause of all deaths for the last 12 months. He has certainly been intimate with a Negro doctor and have gotten physic from him. The people kept it concealed from me till the other day. So Yancey, Yancey's letters uh, indicate that some enslaved people preferred to use African-American folk healers. The accusations of poisoning and the high mortality rate suggest that the treatment involved some sort of poisonous plant or plants. Yet the patients who used the treatment did so willingly because they had faith it would work or because they were deceived about the nature of the treatment. For 12 months, through considerable illness and death, no one informed the overseer about the source of their illness. Their silence suggests they feared the retribution of Hercules or the power of the healer. When enslaved laborers experienced their illnesses through the lens of faith, that faith sometimes, of course, included Christianity as well. At Poplar Forest, Rhoda, in 1846, died of pulmonary disease when she was 32 years old. So um, a medical historian has noted a correlation between degrees of resistance to pulmonary infection and exposure to cool, wet weather. So it's really as a result of their living and working conditions that enslaved people were more susceptible to pulmonary disease than slaveholders. 
Rhoda was only 15 when Cobbs inherited her and she spent most of her adult life at Poplar Forest, again died when she was 32. So her poor health was likely a reflection of her poor living or working conditions, demonstrating the significance of that regulation and control of bodies, the body politic in the health of enslaved laborers. On the night before she died, Rhoda asked two other enslaved laborers, Jacob and Katie, to pray for her. Her request suggested all three practice Christianity and experienced illness at least partly through their faith. In addition to historical documents and probably what you wanted to hear me talk more about is the archaeological evidence that provides clues about how individuals and groups experienced illness. Um, as I said before, because the cause of disease um, was so poorly understood in the 19th century, people treated their symptoms as they defined and made sense of them. So evidence of treatment practices tell us a lot about the experience of illness. Um, Self-selected treatments, things people chose to, to use for themselves, reveal more about the personal experience of affliction. Um, so most of the archeological evidence that we have um, that I'm gonna talk about for the Hutter period for enslaved people comes from this particular cabin known as Site A. Um, it was one cabin. It was located uh, about 200, 300, 300 yards from the main house. Um, so the person who worked there was probably a house servant, at least one of the people who worked there. Um, this is part of the chimney. Um, near that chimney, you can see part of this three by three by three foot subfloor pit. This was dug into the ground. Um, near the chimney because the chimney radiates heat and that helps preserve root crops in the winter. But over time, enslaved people would fill these things up um, with um, other things and when they abandoned the house, put their trash in there. These are gold mines for archaeologists. Um, there were over 35,000 pieces of bone in that three by three by three foot pit alone um, besides all the artifacts that came out. Um, and so this is this is the, where the evidence I'm going to be talking about. Most of it comes from. Um, so, um, let's see. Okay, we have the next one. So one of the things that we found there too are small things that you can't really see well with the naked eye. We take dirt samples and then we send um, those out to specialists who look for evidence of plant remains. And so from that evidence, from amongst that evidence, um, we find evidence of things people were eating, and diet was certainly a preventative thing for health. Um, but we also find evidence of things that may have been used, um, as we see here, as medicinals, um, possibly. So use of medicinal plants was an important part of traditional folk medicine, and Hutter, Edward Hutter, the slave owner, his purchase, he purchased belladonna and aconite, indicating that he incorporated medicinal plants into the healing regimen he employed on the plantation um, as well. So culturally derived origins of diseases and treatments were central to African diasporic populations, and enslaved Africans retained and shared their ethnobotanical expertise as they gained new proficiencies with plants they encountered in their new environments. Um, Carney and Rosimoff noted that 19 genera from 15 botanical families are shared between Africa and the Americas. So people came with a knowledge of what particular plants may have been used for. Um, and then enslaved Africans, enslaved African Americans, and runaway slaves all relied on their ethnobotanical knowledge for survival, healing, and nutrition. Some African and African American healers were skilled in using plant-based remedies to cure both natural and supernatural illnesses. And their knowledge of medicinal plants was sought by blacks and whites and certainly influenced um, American health pra practices overall. So the remains of mint and jimson weed in particular were found within the subfloor pit and that suggests um, they may have had medicinal uses. Mint has, as we know, multiple medicinal uses while Jimson weed was sometimes used by African Americans to treat worms and respiratory problems in the 19th century. Um, Rosowski, another archeologist, interpreted Jimson weed remains at Richneck Plantation in Virginia as evidence of medicine used to relieve pain. And archeologists excavating at the African burial ground in New York City interpreted large quantities of Jimson weed seeds as evidence of hallucinogenic medicine. So in large quantities, these, it is actually hallucinogenic. Um, Purslin and knotweed may have also been cultivated for medicinal purposes as well as sink foil, which you see here. And um, that one in particular, it has five leaves and so it resembles a human hand. Um, 
And the similarity to the form of the human hand makes it useful in African traditional folk-based medicine. Okay, so next. In addition to the macrobotanical remains, there were a number of other types of objects that were found that may have been used for health and well-being. The presence of sulfur is one of those. It's likely the result of African-American folk remedies or home remedies initiated by Hutter. Emma Hutter recorded using sulfur to relieve stomach problems. Edward Hutter used it to cure sick pigs. Um, and he may have given it to enslaved laborers who were suffering from stomach or skin conditions. Alternatively, enslaved African Americans may have used sulfur to treat their illnesses in other ways. According to testimony of former slaves, sulfur matches were sometimes worn as a form of protection from malevolent spirits, and sulfur could be thrown in a fire to change one's luck. Um, so in addition to those things, um, we find um, objects that may have been used as charms to promote health and well-being. Charms or any type of ritual object um, endowed with supernatural powers, and African Americans fashion charms from a diverse array of natural and cultural materials, including animal bones, plant remains, stones, coins, and beads. So if you look at the, the narratives of formerly enslaved people, um, those who discuss the use of glass beads that you see here describe them more often for use as protection and well-being than as use for personal adornment or appearance, or to influence appearance. Um, Okay, next. So glass beads were one kind of object among many enslaved laborers used to ease teething. Narratives of many former slaves de describe many remedies and all sorts of objects for the teething process. And that's because teething was seen as um, not just a simple process, but it was associated with that time frame that was the highest point of infant mortality. So they used a lot of remedies to try um, and protect young children during that teething time period. So, um, and that's true, probably a poplar forest too. Okay, and the next one is, this is a pierced Spanish real. What's interesting about this pierced coin, um, we do find pierced coins in a number of African American sites, and silver is, is important because it's reflective. And the idea behind that is, it can distract any evil spirits and keep them at bay. Right, but this one has teeth marks. So it may have been put around a baby's neck for protection, but also used for teething. Um, so this modification of coins, I think, is also important because um, they were used for protection rather than economic purposes. And we're talking about a group of people who did not have much access to money, and they prioritized the use of this as a charm as opposed to using it as something to buy something else. Okay, next. That circle's weird, but just imagine it looks perfect. So um, the social body reflects the body as a symbol that reflects cultural constructions about society and social relations. So illnesses that are predominantly race, gender, class, or age specific tell us a lot about culture, particularly when there's no precise cluster of symptoms or medical consensus regarding the cause of these illnesses. So then you have to stop and ask yourself, when illness was defined by somebody other than the patient, whose purpose or what purpose did that serve? And clearly when diseases were defined by white physicians and slave owners, those definitions served their purposes. So beyond understanding general 19th century conceptions of health and well-being, it's important to consider that slaveholders tied the health of slaves directly to productivity. Their definition of a healthy enslaved person reflected natural, cultural, and social aspects of health. Nature was present in the form of disease. Culture was represented by 19th century beliefs among whites about the health of African Americans. And the social was situated in the local setting that influenced those two other aspects. White slaveholders understood the health of slaves in terms of what they called soundness. To be sound meant to be free from injury, defect, and disease, and to be in robust and good con condition. And if one's ability to labor was diminished, he or she was not sound and consequently not healthy. So in his farm journal, Edward Hutter documented 13 instances of sickness among enslaved laborers from 1854 to 18, 1844 to 54, over a 10 year period. So in addition to recording who was sick, over time he also began to record the duration of the sickness in order to record how much labor was lost. 
Family letters indicate that there were a number of other enslaved laborers who were sick during the same time frame, but their names were not recorded in the farm journal because their health did not affect profits from field operations. In this situation, who was defined as sick was clearly tied to productivity, role, and status. Hutter did not record which illnesses or diseases affected his enslaved field laborers in that journal, but family records, court records, and the Bedford County Death Index do provide some of that information. From 1853 to 1860, Bedford County recorded the deaths of 1,186 enslaved African Americans and 1,365 whites. So based on population statistics, that's about 13.4 per thousand for our enslaved African Americans, 8.6 per thousand for whites. The racial difference is primarily a, a reflection of the higher death rate for black infants and children under the age of five. So the principal cause of death for all children, remember I said disease is democratic. So for all children across racial lines were croup. Um, oh, yeah, next slide. Um, Principal cause was um, across racial lines were croup, flux, whooping cough, bowel inflammation, scarlet fever, pneumonia, and various kinds of fevers. Um, but scrofula, scrofula, I think I have it's there. It's there. somewhere. Scrofula, <laughs> scrofula um, was. Uh, which is a type of tuberculosis. Worms and smothering were documented exclusively among African-American infants and children. Among older children and adults in Bedford County, scrofula was also documented as a cause of death for 65 African-Americans and only a single white person. Scrofula historically did affect whites living in poverty, particularly children. Therefore, its near absence among whites in Bedford County may indicate a low incidence of poverty among whites in the Bedford County in the antebellum area, but poverty prevailed among enslaved African Americans. Worms were a rampant problem in slave quarters because of poor sanitary conditions and lack of shoes, and consequently the high rates of scrofula and worms among enslaved blacks in antebellum Virginia were a result of poor living conditions created by slaveholders and their racist perceptions that African Americans could better withstand those conditions. Aaron, who was the enslaved headman at Poplar Forest, died from scrofula in 1848. And scrofula was so strongly associated with African Americans in the minds of antebellum whites that Hutter's father wrote a letter and expressed concern for the soundness of Aaron's children because he believed it to be a hereditary ethnic disease. Smothering, which you see here, is a more controversial cause of death. From 1850 to 1860, 21 enslaved infants in Bedford County died according to records from smothering or suffocation. The term smothering, of course, implies that the mother intentionally or not suffocated the child. The further implication of the term, however, and we see this in court records, um, was that it was an act of infanticide. Um, however, these deaths were much more likely the result of sudden infant death syndrome or accidents while co-sleeping, which was a practice all but necessitated by imposed living conditions in smaller spaces. Okay. Um, so to add insult to injury, literally and metaphorically, white physicians' perceptions of health and constitution of enslaved laborers result in disease-causing practices. Um, Samuel Cartwright and J. Marion Sims were physicians who provide useful examples of this. Dr. Cartwright was a prominent physician in Louisiana. In an essay he wrote called The Diseases and Physical Peculiarities of the Negro Race, he described this condition, droptomania. Droptomania he described as a mental disease found among African Americans which manifested itself as dissatisfaction, sulkiness, <laughs> and an uncontrollable urge to run away. Um, he also described um, dysesthesia ethiopica as a mental illness um, found particularly among free blacks that was characterized by malingering or avoiding work. In both cases, he suggested the behavior, uh, he medicalized the behavior of African Americans and proposed treatment for both was whipping. And um, note, enslaved and free blacks. And although reading these descriptions today, it seems like you, you begin to question how seriously Cartwright and his peers believed that those were in fact diseases, but his essay was published in a reputable medical journal and was widely circulated. And in fact, Frederick Law Olmsted 
pondered in print about whether or not um, this Asesia Ethiopica could be caught by Irish laborers on boats. And so it was an infectious disease. Um, so in the 19th century, with the rise of biomedical medicine, gynecology established itself as a specialization. J. Marion Sims is considered to be the founder of this specialization, but he could not have established himself in the biomedical world without access to working class and enslaved women's bodies. He began working on a plantation in Alabama where most of his patients were slaves and moved to Montgomery in 1841 and expanded his practice to include free blacks and eventually the wealthy citizens of Montgomery. The experimentation that was common in his early practice was characteristic of biomedical practice in this period and social, cultural, and historical factors made it possible to use patients according to their social status and gender, and the hospital provided an institutional location for this experimentation. So to sort of establish himself as a professional doctor, Sims began publishing articles about his cases in the early 1840s, and those publications revealed that Sims' medical experience, experiments were performed on infants, working class, and enslaved women, the marginalized, invisible members of 19th century society. These experiments were typically done without anesthesia. And I should point out that most of these, the, the causes that people were suffering, the, the, the diseases people were suffering were actually complications from being forced to immediately after birth go back to the fields. So they would have conditions like prolapsed uterus. And so um, they were doing experiments to see what they could do to fix this without anesthesia. Um, similar surgeries were performed on upper class white women, but they were accompanied by anesthesia based on the premise that white women suffered more pain than poor women of color. Um, so I think the work of Cartwright and Sims clearly reveals the social bodies of blacks as constructed by 19th century whites. Um, and then we have finally the body politic, which refers to power and control. It encompasses the regulation and surveillance of bodies and reproduction, sexuality, work, leisure, and sickness, making it a particularly appropriate concept to apply to enslaved laborers. Like the, experience, like the lived experience of illness, the body politic is also revealed through treatment practices. Microbotanical remains, pharmaceutical bottles and vials, and other artifacts show us the intersection of African-American and European health practices and beliefs. Um, so, wait, let's see. By the mid-19th century, proprietary medicines had become a major industry in the United States. They were marketed as cures for every imaginable ailment, including indigestion, colic, venereal disease, and cancer. The period was one of transition from remedies mixed and bottled by doctors to prepackaged mass marketed medicines. This, was, this change was spurred by the rise of biomedicine and the ability to produce um, through processes of industrialization standardized mold made glass bottles really quickly and cheaply. So here are a few examples of that. Patent and proprietary medicines were used by both whites and blacks. Because enslaved African Americans were sometimes restricted, there were laws in certain time frames from purchasing medicines. It is unclear whether they independently acquired these medicines to use them by choice or they used them because they were required to do so. A consideration of archaeological evidence of patent and pr proprietary medicines from free black sites in central Virginia might shed some light, some comparative data on this issue. But there were four identifiable proprietary medicine bottles. It, recovered from site A. One was a bottle of Dr. Jane's alternative, which you see here. Um, a second bottle held uh, some type of proprietary medicine issued by Jacob Rose. A third was a bottle from W.A. Strathers Pharmacy, and he was a local Lynchburg physician, uh, pharmacist actually. And the final bottle contained, um, probably can't see that well, but bear oil. The particular uses for which consumers at Poplar Forest sought these medicines is unclear but at a general level, they were certainly used to promote health and well-being. Uh, also, a bottle of DeGrasse electric oil was located near the antebellum cabin site, um, which the proximity suggests it was used by the people who lived there. Um, in addition to, on the next slide, in addition to um, those bottles, there were two bottles of spring water. So one is Bedford Alum Springs, which is located um, this is 10 miles, about 10 miles from Poplar Forest um, and Buffalo Springs. They're both located in Virginia and in the mid 19th century, both were places 
of thriving resorts. These resorts and many others like them throughout the valleys of the Blue Ridge and Appalachian Mountains developed as a consequence of the perceived curative waters imparted to hydropathy. And it was common for enslaved laborers to accompany slaveholders to the springs to assist them during their stay and sometimes to benefit themselves as patients from the healing pro properties of the, Bedford, of the springs. The Bedford Alum Springs and Buffalo Springs bottles found at the antebellum cabin were likely used for health practices by the enslaved laborers who lived there, but whether or not they chose it on their own or it was imposed on them is unclear. And we do know that one enslaved woman did go with Marion Cobbs to the springs to help her there, because the letter talks about how her family is missing her at home. So, um, but again, it's hard to say uh, whether they chose to use it or not. And then on the next slide, there's um, a few more examples. Um, so there was a bottle of Barry's Trisophorus for the skin and hair, and a basket weave cologne bottle, and three other bottles um, associated with cosmetic liquids found at the edge of the site. Those include a Madonna and Child cologne bottle, which is here, um, a cologne bottle with an embossed plume, and a bottle of Harrison's Colombian hair dye. Um, <laughs> So the contents of those bottles may have been used solely for cosmetic purposes, but Lori Wilkie, another archaeologist um, investigating late 19th century African American midwife practices, suggests midwives used cosmetic liquids to prepare women for childbirth. It was a process called fussing. And so they would rub oils and perfumes on the body. And um, merchant account books that I've researched um, in 19th century Virginia record enslaved people buying perfumes. So it could have been used that way. Um, in the 20th century, Carrie Cobbs, Rucker, an African-American woman, lived on land that was once part of Poplar Forest Plantation. She was a midwife in the forest area from the, mid, from the early to mid 20th century, and she was a descendant of enslaved laborers from Poplar Forest and may have learned midwifery from her mother there. Okay, the next one. Regulation of enslaved bodies also took the form of slave management practices. In the antebellum period, particular groups of individuals were more likely than others to be hired out. So you may or may not be familiar with this process, but in the 18th, 19th century, slave owners would sometimes hire out enslaved laborers to other people to do various jobs. And this became increasingly common in the antebellum period. The groups most affected by this practice included young, able-bodied men, pregnant women, and women with infants. Slaveholders engaged in this practice because they considered pregnant and nursing women to be, and they literally called them encumbered or reduced in their capacity to perform labor. And you can see that because they get hired out for free or for a very small fee, like $10. They're perceived as a burden. And so sometimes women with infants were hired out as wet nurses. Um, as well, and consequently, pregnant and nursing women produced income for slaveholders through their labor fees at a time when their work capacity was perceived to be reduced. Again, the idea of soundness. So while this practice was beneficial to slaveholders, it was not beneficial to the health of enslaved women or their children. Hutter frequently hired out pregnant women and women with nursing infants. He hired out Susan in 1854 with her infant and young child, um, Coleman and Elizabeth. Elizabeth actually died during this hiring period, and the practice of removing mothers and their young children from family and social networks on the home plantation at precisely a time when those networks were truly needed could have dire consequences for the children and the mother. Uh, labor management practices within a plantation could also impact health as suggested by the death of Letitia, um, who's also known as Letitia. This is Letitia or Letitia here. Um, so she was born in 1826, and she spent most of her time as a house servant at Poplar Forest. Less than two weeks after she married in 1843, she was hired out for the year with her infant son, Daniel, which we see here. Um, she returned to work as a house servant at Poplar Forest in 1845, and in 1846, had her sent her out to work in the fields. This was probably part of a labor restructuring process necessitated by his decision to grow tobacco for a few years to recover economic losses suffered from an 1845 house fire at Poplar Forest. In 1846, Lydia gave birth to another son named Sandy. Daniel, first child, died in 1846, and Sandy died in 1847, shortly followed by their mother. 
The causes of their deaths was not documented, but their health was probably impacted by the changing work routine and its effect on pregnancy and caring for infants and young children. So another interesting thing happens with this on the next slide is Hutter had paid for a physician to perform a post-mortem exam before Letitia's burial. This unusual practice may indicate that he decided to hire Letitia out during the year and did not record it. Post-mortem exams were sometimes performed to satisfy insurance claims. Life insurance policies for hired and slave laborers were a new phenomenon in the antebellum period that emphasized the ambiguity between the dual status of enslaved people as people and as property. Lynchburg Fire and Hose Company was one of the group of insurers known to have sold life insurance for enslaved laborers. This is from the Lynchburg paper. And Hutter owned stock in that company. Um, so it seems likely he had this insurance. He also, Hutter also paid a family physician $5 um, for a fee to bond to hire Susan. So this was likely the fee to certify her health that was required to purchase the insurance. Life insurance policies were another means that slaveholders used to attempt to control their economic risks when they surrendered control by hiring out enslaved laborers to others. But these policies could not, nor were they meant to, protect enslaved laborers from the real risks of bodily danger in the forms of abuse, illness, exposure, dangerous working conditions, and death. So, an investigation of health consumerism using Shepard Hughes and Locke's three bodies model reveals that enslaved laborers were more likely than whites to suffer from disease, though less likely to be allowed to be ill. Health was precarious in the 19th century. Maintaining and restoring it was particularly complex for enslaved laborers whose choices were very circumscribed. Their living and working conditions put them at risk for many kinds of diseases and injuries. They could do little to change these conditions. As health consumers, enslaved laborers had limited input into decisions about their own health care. Virginia legislation in 1856 made it illegal for a druggist to sell any poisonous drug to a slave or free black without an owner's or master's consent. And when outwardly or visibly sick, enslaved people often had to submit to treatment by owners or physicians without their approval. But enslaved laborers could and did find ways to engage in African-based health practices through using self-procured objects in distinctive ways and seeking out African-American healers. The latter became more complicated in the Antebellum period as industrial slavery and increased hiring of enslaved women for domestic service resulted in large numbers of enslaved laborers being removed from established networks that were critical for health care and well-being. Archaeological and historical evidence shows that enslaved laborers employed multiple strategies to achieve wellness, including their own remedies, remedies administered by the planter family and overseer, and remedies provided by local physicians and proprietary medicines. So on a local scale, instead of solely subjecting themselves to white professional medicine, enslaved laborers also attempted their own cures made from plants, minerals, and man-made objects in their environment. Using African-based folk medicine may have been a way to ex exercise a degree of self-control over their bodies and health. And on a broader scale, the consumption of proprietary medicines by the inhabitants of the antebellum cabin represents the use of regional and national health practices that were non-traditional and developed through broader process, social processes of mass production and mass marketing. Yet enslaved laborers incorporated these medicines into or alongside folk medicinal practices rather than replacing them when navigating the fine line between health and illness. So even more so, I think, than marriage, the institution of slavery was a situation of sick, sickness and health until death do us part. And studies of health and well-being have much to reveal about these cultural entanglements. Thank you. Hopefully now, if you have questions, I can answer your questions. Could you tell from, from some of those bottle fragments what was in them? I mean, what the ingredients were? So the, here's the thing about and the reason why they're called patent medicines and proprietary medicines. People didn't want to reveal what was in them um, because then people could copy them. So what they would do is patent the bottle. And, so, and then they didn't have to reveal what was in them. But could you, with today's technology, can we tell? You can, if, if there can be residues sometimes. And then in the late 19th century, when people were, some of these same companies were still around, they were required to, and they were 80% alcohol. There was a lot of alcohol. Uh, there was some cocaine in there. There was, yes, yeah, interesting. 
Self-medication. Self-medication. Did you? Yes. Uh, a little bit drawn about the story, but I'd like to have your comment on it. Back in the early 1800s, the only real viable uh, economy of uh, Bermuda was shipbuilding. Yep. And uh, somewhere around 1809, uh, they had a terrible plague, and in the shipbuilding, all the shipbuilders are white, the uh, skilled shipbuilders are white, but they had black laborers. Sure. The plague wiped out most of the shipbuilders, but not one black laborer. So the Bermudas at that point realized that they could not afford to have that happen again because it took them a number of years to get building. back and do shipbuilding, to retrain, again, people. So at that point, they decided that they had to train black shipbuilders. And uh, then they went to uh, the British-controlled part of Florida, I think Jacksonville area, and imported, in around 1823, uh, quite a few blacks uh, to Bermuda to become shipbuilders. Yeah. And they never experienced again that wipeout by a plague or a major disease going through them. So my question then is, did the black slaves experience the same mortality, smallpox, yellow fever, typhoid? How, how does that mesh with the whites? It did, it did affect equally across those things that smallpox, yellow fever, scarlet fever. There are records at Poplar Forest of, you know, white children and black children at the same time sharing the scarlet fever back and forth. But there were other things like yaws that you see in the Caribbean um, that African descendant people knew remedies for that whites didn't. And sometimes they were able to use that to get their freedom. They would treat whites if they could gain their freedom. So it may have been the case that whatever that particular plague was was something that they knew, some medicinal plants that were useful that that knowledge was not shared <laughs> with them, with the whites in that case. Um, so yeah, there were sometimes those were the case, um, but usually things like smallpox and, and smallpox actually no was chickenpox. They all had chickenpox at the same time too. Um, so yeah. Other questions? You guys have been so patient. Thank you. I know I talked a lot. Yes. Do you have any information about marijuana use? We actually, that's a good question. So in the 18th century poplar forest, um, hemp was a major, um, many plantations, 18th century, because it's such a great product for making rope and that sort of thing. So Jefferson was growing hemp. Um, and one of the things we found at poplar forest in the Jefferson period, slave cabins, was a really interesting and unique form of stone pipes that were carved. And then we found some in Charlottesville that they were carving as well. The thing is, those were found alongside British pipes too. So one of our questions was, were these used to smoke something different? So we did send them off for trace analysis. Um, so we didn't, when you find those archeologically, we didn't clean them out. We kept the dirt in them and we sent them off and they, there wasn't enough residue left to tell. Now, there may be more methods now, as you're saying, technology has changed that you might be able to tell, but it, the results came back inconclusive. So it's, it's possible, certainly very possible. People had a good understanding of medicinal plants, so, but it's not documented. Yeah, there's a really, um, so the, the medical, the, the history of medicine um, scholar that I talked about, Todd Savitt, he has a whole book about 19th century um, African American medicine. And so he looks at specifically some of those issues. People thought that there were more um, genetic causes than there were. There are some cases like the sickle cell um, trait that you find that in malarial populations that are, um, um, African-American or African diaspora populations, but also in Asia, 
that people will maintain sickle cell. So there are there can be some adaptations that are usually adaptations to environment. Could also be that that particular person had been exposed as somebody who traveled around on ships to the disease before and it didn't kill them. And so they were kind of immune to it. Um, so there are a lot of possibilities, but few of them were genetic difference. Few of them were genetic differences. Yeah. Do you notice when you going from say Florida, which has you know had the Spanish influence, yep. up into you know the, the you know the colonies in Virginia up in there? Do you notice a higher rate maybe of uh, uh, what do I want to say? Higher skilled medicine where maybe there was the techniques were more improved maybe as you went in certain areas or maybe around more populated areas or? That's a good question. Um, I, I've only recently started touring the Spanish museums of medicine in St. Augustine, so I've been looking into that only recently. That's something I'm really going to pursue and see what the differences were. Um, the Spanish did have, uh, and a lot of the Americans in the 18th and 19th century would go to Europe for medical training. So I would imagine that they, uh, the health rates were better. Um, but I don't, I don't have any evidence to back that up at this point. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for being my slide.